Well, hello and welcome to Movement Church Online. I'm Chris. I'm the pastor here at Movement, and I just want to say welcome to Movement. We're so glad that you guys are here and taking some time out of your day, out of your week to spend some time with us, whether you're you know, catching up with us, whether you're joining us live on, on a Sunday, or whether you're catching up after a hunting trip or a football game. We're so glad that you're taking some time out of your day, out of your week to join with us as we study the Word of God, as we worship together. Uh, we, we think there's nothing better to do on a Sunday or whenever it is that you may be doing it today. So we're, we're today we're beginning a brand new series called Arm. We're talking about the armor of God because whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, every single one of us woke up today and found ourselves in a fight, found ourselves in a battle, and that's with the enemy of God and the enemy of our soul. So today we're going to, we're going to start this six-week series talking about how we fight back in the battle for our souls. And so I'm incredibly excited to keep to, to begin talking about the armor of God and how it applies in our lives. So we're going to dive right in today to part one of our series, Armored. Well, I don't know how many of you have ever had something like this happen to you, but recently we got a new episode in our seemingly never-ending air conditioning saga. Uh, at the end of August, we started hearing this incredibly loud sound every time our AC was running. Um, like it would kick on and all of a sudden this loud rumbling sound would start and it would continue until our house, you know, reached the temperature, reached the desired point, and then the noise would finally stop. And it actually started to reach a point where it wasn't just a noise, um, you know, we could where, where we could see parts of the blower unit in the garage were just like, you know, shaking every time the blower was. So we're like, we, we actually actually feel the walls starting to shake that were closest to the blower. So, you know, it, it was just the, like, you know, the walls on the backside of the, of, of the garage coming into the house, those walls would actually shake. You could put your hand on and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, we're shaking now. Okay, so the list of things I know to do when it comes to HVAC is very short. I know to try changing the air filter. That's the entire list, right? Like, which was at, at that point, slightly over the three month mark. So I changed the air filter. It got quieter for about two days and then pretty quickly got back to being really loud. And again, that's the end of the list of things that I know how to try. So I call our HVAC guy who, uh, who, you know, everything is still under warranty with. He opened up the unit. He tightened a few screws that were a little bit loose on the blower casing. And he said that that should take care of everything. It absolutely did not. So I called him to come back out and it took him a while to be, come, to be able to come back out because he got sick uh, and all that kind of stuff. But when he came back this past week, he brought someone with and they disassembled the entire casing and the blower. And when they removed it and were able to get a look at it, they quickly realized that inside the casing on the back of the blower, there was actually a crack in the fan and a crack in the bracket that attaches to the housing. That's what was causing the, 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 the rumbling. That's what was causing the noise. That's what was causing the shaking. It was actually something that we couldn't see impacting everything we could see and hear and feel with our hands on the walls. Now, I said I don't know how many of you have experienced something like that, but actually I know that all of us have experienced something like that because all of us, every single day, we find ourselves in a battle that takes place in the spiritual realm, unseen in the spiritual unseen aspects of life that affects everything that we see and everything that we feel and everything that we hear and everything that we experience. Like when the Apostle Paul sat down and penned what we now know as the section of Ephesians known as the armor of God, this is actually the very experience that he was describing. Here's what he wrote starting in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. In Ephesians 6 verse 10 he says this, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against the things that you can see, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Now, a few things that we need to understand about this battle from what, from what we just read there. Number one is that the battle is unavoidable. 
There is no way to avoid this battle because this is a battle between God and the enemy of God for your life and for your soul and for the, and for, for all, for all of creation. And our enemy will use anything and everything in this life and in this world to distract you from the things of God, to divide you from the people and places that God wants to use as a force for good in your life, to deceive you away from the truth of God that is a power for light and life, and to drive a wedge of mistrust between you and your heavenly father. And if that wasn't enough, enough, we have an enemy who brings the fight to us. Again, you don't have to go looking for a fight. Sometimes life isn't a battle because you did anything wrong, but because while you're trying to walk right and, li and live right, the enemy brings conflict and hardship to, it, to you in an attempt to move you away from what's right and what's good and what's healthy. Like the fight is unavoidable. The battle is unavoidable. And the second thing that we need to understand is that while the, the battle is unavoidable, the second thing you need to know is that the, our, our enemy is invisible. Our enemy is invisible. Paul tells us your fight is not against flesh and blood. It's against the unseen forces of this world. So often we make this, we, we mistake the source of the conflict. We think that because I have difficulty with them, that they're the problem. When the real problem is there's an enemy who wants to cause conflict between you and them to keep them from being a force of good in your life and keep you from being a force for good in their life. As long as we think blank, is the issue. We've actually missed the whole point and we end up fighting the wrong battle with the wrong person. Our enemy is invisible, but there's actually something a little more sinister going on here. Our enemy wants to convince us that invisible equals fictional or that invisible equals not to be taken seriously. But just like an HVAC unit, something we don't see absolutely is not fictional. That crack is absolutely real. Our enemy is absolutely real and absolutely to be taken seriously and absolutely to be corrected and absolutely to be fought against because he is a formidable foe. But while he's invisible and while he's a formidable foe, he is not equal to our heavenly father. The third thing we need to know is that our weapons are not physical. So our enemy is invisible and our weapons are not physical. Because our enemy is not physical, neither are our weapons. You don't fight an invisible enemy with visible, tangible weaponry. And that sounds a little bit discouraging to us. For those of us who live in the tangible world, for those of us who live in the physical world, it would be much easier for us to picture fighting with physical weaponry because we think if our weapons aren't physical or tangible, that somehow makes them inferior. But what's really interesting to know about the armor that Paul describes for us is that every first single, uh, first, every single first century reader having a deep understanding of the Old Testament scripture would have immediately triggered back to this text from Isaiah 59 and Isaiah's prophetic vision of God as the divine warrior with a helmet of salvation and a breastplate of his own righteousness. Does that sound familiar? Like what's amazing about that is that like when you, when you understand this, We've been given the same armor and weaponry that God himself wears into battle. While our weapons are not physical, they also are not inferior. Our weapons, they're not physical, but they also are not inferior. Our helmet may not be a physical helmet, but it is not inferior protection for your mind. While our sword may not be tangible, it is no less effective against the enemy. Our weapons are not physical, but they also are not inferior. They're the same weapons that God himself wears into battle. And the fourth thing that we need to understand is that while there's a battle that is unavoidable and there's an enemy that's invisible and our weapons are not, phys are, are not, are, are, are not physical, but they are also are not inferior, we also need to know that our victory is assured. That, 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 we, that we are promised victory on the last day. If you've, if you've read the end of the story, spoiler alert, we win because God wins. But we're also promised victory today. Paul assures us that if we'll put on the full armor of God, when evil comes at us, when, it temp when temptation comes our way, when the enemy attempts to divide us from one another, we don't get knocked down. But if we, and if we do get knocked down, we certainly do not get knocked out. But if, at the end of it, we stand in victory. At the end of today, we stand in victory. We do not have to wait to experience victory. It is available for us today. There's a battle that's unavoidable with an, en with an enemy that's invisible. And our weapons, they are not physical, but they also are not inferior. And because they are not inferior, when we actually take up the full armor of God in the battle uh, that is unavoidable against an enemy that's invisible, our victory is assured. 
We do not have to wait until the end to experience the victory that God has for us and wants for us today. So, with all of that as our introduction, Paul then begins to unpack what our weapons are as we engage in this battle. And the very first weapon that he mentions is, comes to us from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14. Right after the passage we just read, he goes immediately into what the armor of God is. He says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, what is our first piece of armor in our fight with the enemy? The first piece of armor is the belt of truth. Why? I mean, like, because the way we think about getting dressed, like, the belt's the last thing you put on. Like, the belt is, the, like, you, you, you put on your, your, your undergarments, you put on your socks, you put on your shirt, you put on your pants, and then after you got everything else on, you put on your belt as the final piece of the thing. Why does Paul want us to have the first thing to be the belt of truth? Because Paul thought of a belt, and the people in that time thought of a belt as something a little bit differently than we think of a belt. Our first piece of armor is the belt of truth, because our enemy's primary method of attack is through deception. This is why we get the belt of tru truth first, because our enemy's, our enemy's primary method of attack is through deception. Our enemy is the master of deception and the master of illusion. Genesis chapter 3, when the first time we're in introduced to the devil or Satan or the serpent or the snake is, is, when the, is when he shows up to the woman. He says, did God really say? Like, did God... Like, did, did God really say all that? Did God really mean that? Is, oh, oh, sure, like, oh, surely God, you know, God's trying to keep you away from something because he doesn't want you to be like him. Like, hey, no, God's trying to keep you away from something because there's something that would harm you, that would cause you harm. Like, twist, it's, it, that, yes, God was trying to keep you away from something, but twist the, 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 the thing that he's trying to keep you from. John 8, 44, Jesus actually calls the devil the father of lies. The father of lies, meaning like all lies are born from him. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14, Paul, who wrote the, the piece on the armor of God says, Satan himself, he masquerades, he even, he hides and disguises himself as an angel of light. He confuses us and tricks us, deceives us into believing that what he's saying and what comes from him is the same as the light from God. And here's the thing that we need to understand because this is so primary, this is the primary way our, our enemy comes at us. The devil will use anything he can to deceive you because if he can keep you deceived, he can keep you bound. He will use anything he can to deceive you because if he can keep you deceived, he will keep you bound. This is actually where, why Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The other side of that is what the devil knows, that if he can keep you deceived, he can keep you from freedom. So what does God give us to fight the deception of the, and the lies of the enemy? He gives us a belt. He gives us a belt. And here's what the belt does. Buckling the belt of truth affirms that God's truth is my standard of truth. That I accept God's truth as my truth. I don't have my truth and that, and then hope and choose the pieces of God's truth that happen to align with my truth. I choose God's truth first and I buckle myself into the idea that God's truth is truth. And I choose his, and I choose God's truth as my standard of truth. I filter everything in this life. I filter every decision I make. I filter every every everything that every thought in my head. I filter every choice that I make, every direction I move, every everything I hear from from anyone like I simply I filter it through God's truth. I choose God's truth as my standard and I choose God's truth as my filter. It's saying, God, I choose your truth as the authority over my life and in this world. That God, your word is the authority, not an authority. It is the option, not an option that his word and his truth, it's not an option, it's the option. It's not a suggestion, it's commands that lead to life and peace. I filter every thought, every decision, every input through what I know to be true because it's God's truth that I've adopted as my standard for living. 
So the enemy may try to convince me that God is distant or he's absent when life circumstances aren't what I hoped they would be. But God's word that is truth, it tells me that God is close to the brokenhearted and he has an ever-present help in times of need. And the enemy may try to convince me that I'm unworthy of friendship, but God's word gives me a twofold truth that we are made for community and simultaneously reminds us that friendship starts with being a certain kind of friend. You are like... I'm, I'm unworthy of the lies. I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy of friendship. I'm unworthy of friendship. No, you were made for friendship. You were made for community and you're called to, to pursue it and to be the kind of friend that builds community. Now, what's, what's so interesting to think about is that for everyone who is reading this, they would have immediately pictured a Roman centurion. They would have gone back to Isaiah 59 and the divine warrior, but they would have also immediately pictured a Roman centurion because everyone had seen them and seen them frequently. People were well acquainted with a soldier's uniform and the functionality of, of each piece on their armor. And here was the purpose of the belt. This was the purpose of the belt. It, like as much as, it, as we go, man, when, when, I, when I buckle the, the belt of truth, it's, it's choosing God's standard as my standard. The belt had to be strong enough to stabilize. On a Roman soldier's you know, uniform, the belt had to be strong enough to stabilize. Like we need extra strength at the core. They, they needed extra strength at the core. Everything was connected to the belt. Like everything girded and buckled to the belt. The, 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 the sword sheathed into the belt. Roman shoes many times had ties that actually attached to this very belt. The breastplate, uh, which we're going to talk about next week is the breastplate of righteousness, but the actual soldier's breastplate, it weighed a little over 70 pounds. And if all of that weight was on your shoulders, it becomes incredibly difficult to move. So you could be a soldier standing, but you couldn't be a soldier moving. Uh, and so, in, so what they did is in order to take some of the weight off the shoulders that the breastplate of right uh, the breastplate of a soldier actually attached to the belt of the soldier which took some weight off of the shoulders and allowed them to have the stability of their core in order to actually move forward in life like a really good visual is actually if you ever played football and had to wear the hip pads um, I should say if you played football you had to wear the the the, the hip pads because it was the foundation layer that everything kind of everything else kind of built onto and attached to and and the reason for this as the foundation of a football uniform and a Roman centurion's uniform is that this area on your body is central to your life you need extra strength at your core you need extra strength in order to move appropriately in order to be able to move the way that you're supposed to be able to move. And for something to provide extra strength and support, it has to be something firm and unchanging, something that stands the test of time and something that stands the test of difficult circumstances. God's truth, the reason the belt is the belt of truth is that God's truth, it stands the test of time. God's truth does not change based on the culture around us. And God's truth has never withered and has never weakened in an ever changing world, in a life full of circumstances beyond our control, in a fight with an enemy working to undermine us at the very core. We need something to bring us stability so that we can stand firm. And the good news today as we begin this series is that God's truth is strong enough to stabilize you. That you can move throughout life because you have been with, 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 the, with the strength that you need, with the sustenance that you need, sustained in the way that you need, strong enough because your belt of truth is enough to sustain you. You need something that is, you need extra strength that, is, that, sustain, that stabilizes you and sustains you for the battle that is to come. The tr God's truth is strong enough to stabilize you in a world where it feels like everything is changing and everything is wobbly and everything is going crazy. And this is coming from this direction. And this is coming from this direction. And how am I going to ever be li live stabilized in, in this kind of world? We don't build our lives on the world. We build our lives around the truth of God because his truth is enough to stabilize you. So, so, so a belt on a soldier's uniform, it had to be strong enough to stabilize, but it also had to be fortified enough to bring freedom. Now, the, the, the final thing to understand about a belt in those days is that whether it was a Roman officer or an everyday citizen, most people wore some sort of belt. And, and contrary to today where, where we wear belts to keep our pants from falling down or in order to accessorize and finalize an outfit, the reason most people wore belts then had more to do with something they wanted to tuck up. 
See, in a time and area where clothing primarily consisted of long flowing robes, whenever someone wanted to move quickly, their greatest concern was tripping and slipping over their long flowing robes. This, if, if you're a lady who's ever worn a long dress that was maybe a little bit longer than your body, you know the difficulty that comes if you try to move quickly is you're gonna slip and trip on your dress, right? So the purpose of the belt was that a person would be able to take their long flowing robes and pull them up and tuck them into the belt allowing them to move freely, quickly, and confidently. The belt provided freedom that they otherwise would not have had. Now, I, I know what we all kind of think here. I like God's word and everything, and I like God's truth, but God's truth comes with God's instruction and God's way and even some of God's restraints. And, and one of the biggest lies that we have believed as a society is that to be truly free, it means I have to throw off all restraints. So I can't be free if I'm restrained by anything or anyone, including God. I'm only free if I'm doing whatever I want, whenever I want, with whomever I want. But here's the problem with that, and you already kind of know this. Whenever we do whatever we want, whenever we want, with whomever we want, we never actually end up where we want to end up. Because whatever and whenever and whoever, living that way either leads us nowhere specific or leads us nowhere good or leads us nowhere at all. See, here's the truth. Just like a belt with long flowing robes, restraints don't restrict us from freedom. Restraints actually enable real freedom. Restraints actually enable real freedom. The restraint that is found in God's word, it never restricts us from freedom, only a distorted view, version and a distorted view of freedom. God's godly restraints keep us from things that would harm us so that we can actually live in real freedom and have the freedom to end up where we want and end up being the people that we want, living the life that we actually want in the long run. Restraints don't keep us from actual freedom. Restraints enable us to live in and experience real freedom. So, like, here's why this is worth talking about. Almost every time God wants to move you forward, it will require tucking yourself into God's truth into the stability of, 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 of the truth that is able to st stable, the strength that is able to stabilize your life, tucking yourself into the, the truth of God's word that allows you to live in freedom, tucking yourself into God's truth. It will require you to embrace a truth that you have resisted to this point. This is how forward motion happens in a Christian's life. This is how growth happens in a Christian's life. We don't just grow closer to God. What we do is we accept and embrace God's truth as our truth. We accept the truth and embrace the truth that we have resisted to this point. And as we see God's way work, we go, I'm moving forward. I trust God in a deeper way. My life is, is, is more aligning with what God's like. What's coming out of my life and my relationships it's more what God has for me and what God talks about because I'm actually following his way. And so here's the question as, 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 as we come to a close today. Is there an area of your life where you've been resisting God's truth that you need to embrace? Like, is there an area of your life where you've been resisting God's truth and you need to embrace it before it's too late? Is, is there an area of your life where you're going like, man, I feel like God has more for me. I feel like God wants more for me. I feel like there's more to life than what I'm experiencing. And at the same time, you're kind of re like, you know, there are, there are things in God's word that actually address the specific thing that you're talking about. But, and, and you've been resisting the truth because the truth is uncomfortable. You've been resisting the truth because the truth would require you to do something that you don't want to do, to requiring a step that you don't want to take. And as long as you're resisting that step, as long as you're resisting that truth because it's uncomfortable, because it's a step you don't want to take, you will not experience the freedom that God has on the other side of tucking yourself into his truth. So is there an area of your life where you've been resisting God's truth that you need to embrace his truth? And not to push too hard, but again, is there an area of your life where you've been resisting God's truth and you need to embrace his truth before it's too late? For some of you, like the, as we talk about this, like there, there's the idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness is hard. 
Forgiveness feels like we're letting the other person off the off the hook. Forgiveness feels like we're we're saying it was no big deal, and it was a and, and it was a big deal. And, and and I understand all the pushback that we get when it comes to forgiveness. But when it comes to forgiveness, what we need to understand is forgiveness is not ultimately about them. Forgiveness is about what you're carrying around in your heart. And if we're carrying something around in our heart towards someone that we claim to care for and love, like and, and no matter what what it may be, we need to understand that forgiveness is about finding freedom. It's tucking ourselves up into forgiveness the way that God. God, through Jesus Christ has forgiven us. We forgive freely because we want to experience freedom in our own hearts. We don't want to carry around bitterness and, and pain. Instead, let's choose to forgive. And that's how God moves us forward. Maybe it's mutual submission in the family. Maybe as, as a husband, you find it so difficult to love your wife like Christ loved the church. Like, you, like you, or, or, or as a wife, you're like the idea of respecting your husband or, or, or submitting to someone else's leadership, you're like, I'm just not, not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And I'm telling you, as long as you go, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm telling you, there's a good chance that you'll never experience in your family the goodness and the life and the freedom that God has for your family. Maybe it's the idea of friendship like we talked about earlier. There's, there's there, those verses that say things like, you know, a person who wants to be a friend must first be friendly. The, the, the man who would, would, would have friends must first be friendly, must, must first become a friend. That for some of us, we're like, we want friendship and we want friendship and we want community and we want community. And we've never taken this step that like, I actually have to be a friend. I can't expect other people to come towards me when I won't move towards them. There's a, there's a step that to experience friendship and community, there's a truth that God has for you. Maybe it's simply the truth that God can be trusted with your whole life. You've trusted God for salvation. You've trusted for God for the areas where, where you have no answers and you have no control. But in the areas where you have some control and where you think you've got some answers, you find it incredibly difficult to trust God with those areas of your life. But the truth is that God can be trusted with every area of your life. He can be trusted with your whole life, not just the areas that you have no idea how to handle and not just the things that you can't possibly do for yourself. He can be trusted with your whole life. That's the truth. And as long as you're trying to tuck up certain areas of your life and leave certain areas of your life untucked and in your own hands, I'm just telling you, you will not experience the relationship with God and the freedom that God has for you in this life when you actually trust Him with your whole life. Maybe it's the truth that he has never and he will never leave you or forsake you. I mean, when you go through some of the most difficult moments of your life, you go like, hey, you know, I, like God's, God's good, but he's the God of the mountaintop. He's not the God of the valley. And so I've got to go through this on my own. He's the God on the mountaintop and he's the God of the valley. He will walk with you through any and every situation and circumstance of life that he, that he is invited into. Maybe you have the thought of like, hey, you know what? I've kind of believed the lie that, you know, if I'm going through something difficult, it's because God's left me. It's because God's abandoned me, that God didn't answer the prayer the way I prayed it. And so that means God's not present in my life anymore. And, and I'm just telling you, bad things happen in life. And God is still present with you and he is still good and he is still faithful. And it's time for us, even like in the, on, the, on the best days of our lives and the worst days of our lives, to realize that God is good and God is faithful and God is strong and he never leaves us and he never forsakes us because that's who he is. That's the truth. And as long as we filter our opinion of who God is and where God is based on the circumstances of our lives, we are, we, we, we are, we're, we're going to be tripping over our long robes. It's time to, to, to tuck those robes into the belt of truth of who God is and what he has for us. So here's the thing. Every single one of us that woke up today, we woke up and today you're going to take part in a battle that's unavoidable. And you're going to take part in a battle against an, uh, an enemy that's invisible. And you're going to, and, and in, this, in, the, in this series, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the weapons that we have to use. And they may not be physical, but our victory is assured if we will take up everything that God has provided for us to fight against the enemy in the fight and in the battle that we find ourselves living 
in. And so today, I hope that you will decide to buckle the belt of truth around your waist, that everything connects to that. Everything flows from that, from the stability that comes from the belt of truth because it is strong enough to support you. It is strong enough to sustain you. His truth is strong enough to sustain you through every moment of life that you go through and every moment of the fight that you find yourself in. And it's flexible and and it's firm enough to provide you all of the freedom and enable the freedom that God has for you. So I hope today you'll make the decision to make God's truth your truth and buckle the belt of truth and live out of the the sustaining strength of, of the God who loves you and is with you in the fight and who has provided a way for you to experience real freedom in and through the fight. Let's buckle the belt of truth And I look forward to next week as we talk about the breastplate of righteousness that connects to this belt. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are so good and that you have good for us. Thank you that you are an amazing God who loves us and sent Jesus to die for us as the ultimate victory over the enemy. And thank you that we can know you because of what Jesus has done for us. God, today I pray that we would have the wisdom today to recognize the the truth of this word because it's the truth of your word. God, would you help us today to buckle the belt of truth in our battle against the enemy? God, would you help us to realize that this is something we need every moment of every single day, that we need to buckle your belt of truth in our lives and around our lives. God, would you help us to trust your truth and accept your truth and embrace your truth as our truth, as our standard for living, as our standard for everything, as our filter for everything that it all would get filtered through you. And God, thank you that it's strong enough to support us in the areas of our life where we need it the most. Thank you that it brings us flexibility, that, that, that brings us the ability to move with freedom that we, that we need. And God, today, I just simply pray for anyone who's listening today and watching today. God, where, 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 where their, their tendency is to have an area of life that just leans a little bit differently, that moves a little bit differently, that, uh, that is resisting your truth, that is refusing to buckle up and, and to tuck up into your truth. God, I pray that, you would have the wi- that we would have the wisdom today to God accept and embrace your truth. And God, as we accept and embrace your truth, it would lead us to experience real freedom in every area of our lives. So God, help us have the wisdom to do this. Help us have the courage to keep doing it to choose your, your, your truth, and to embrace and live in and out of your truth. Help us to do that, God, today as we fight this battle. Help us to win because of what, what, what you've provided for us with the belt of truth. We love you, God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb and all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. If you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, sing the song forever to the Lamb. in freedom and if you bear his name sing the song forever to the lamb every 
Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us today for, for st to study the Word of God together, to worship together. Uh, hopefully you found today to be hope-filled, encouraging, challenging. Hopefully it leaves you a better follower of Jesus and more equipped to win in the battle for our souls, in the battle that we all find ourselves in. So today, as we close out, we got just a few next steps that we'd love to encourage you to take to keep engaging with our church beyond this weekend experience. First of all, we want to let you know the ways that you can give. If you want to, if you want to give, we want to make sure that you know how, and you can give online, you can give with our cash app, or you can give... Uh, through, through our mail service, but however and whenever you give, thank you so much for your generosity that enables and empowers so much ministry through our church. It could not happen without your generosity, and we're so grateful for your continued belief in, in the mission and the vision of our church, and for your continued belief and your continued investment into our church that makes so much ministry possible. Thank you so much for your generosity. And then we also want to let you know if you have a need, we would love to hear from you so we know how we can be the church for you in your time of need. If there's a way we can pray for you, if there's a way we can pastor you and be there with you in your time of need, or if there's a way we can partner with you to meet your need, we would love to hear from you. So please reach out by phone, by Facebook, or by email, and we would just love to hear from you so we know how we can be the church for you in your time of need. And that's all we've got for you today. We'll look forward to seeing you next week for part two of Armored. Until then, I hope you have a great week, and I hope you'll keep being the movement. <laughs>